G'day, I'm Sean and welcome to the Car Expert Podcast. It has been the fastest week in Melbourne. The F1's just been run and done. Ferrari won. Uh, if you were on Ligon Street last night, leave a comment and let us know how it was. How did you survive? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, you're probably not watching this at this point. You're probably still asleep. But uh, <laughs> Scott and James, how did you guys uh, spend your F1 weekend? Uh, I spent my Saturday at the Grand Prix. Um, I was lucky enough to go along with Porsche and enjoy some exit of turn one views of qualifying, which was awesome. Um, I also managed to get myself a ride in the passenger seat of the Ford Supervan with Dan Ricciardo driving, which we'll was talk just about that soon. a mind-blowing experience. Yeah, we'll go into that. I watched it from the comfort of my living room. And I'll tell you what, uh, and this is probably a controversial opinion, the F1 race was the least interesting race of the weekend oh, from the Grand absolutely. Prix, I reckon. It was, the supercars were unreal, F2, F3 were great, the Porsches were out of this world, mm. the, the some crazy racing there. Uh, one thing I loved was the, all the twilight racing that the support categories did. I thought it was really, like just really sold the whole Melbourne event and the, and the atmosphere and everything you get there. But um, we do want to talk about the super van because <laughs> yes, uh, please. I, we've talked about it on the podcast before. Now, uh, for those that don't know, the Ford super van is basically every tradies damp dream. Uh, <laughs> damp dream. <laughs> it is, I don't know yeah. that it would do much for tradies because when you see it in person, it's got it's not actually really a van. It's got a van cabin on the front and then this really aggressively sort of pinched bit behind it, almost like the engine cover on an F1 car. Uh, I think your Australia Post deliveries would be very heavily delayed if they tried to yeah. take them in that thing. Yes, well, they couldn't get any more delayed. Yeah, true. Um, now, basically, it's, it's got four electric motors, one for each wheel, that they can turn on and off as required. So, and I think at max power, it's like 1400 kilowatts or something. Something insane like that. It depends on how they're running it, obviously. Um, but it's Ford kind of saying, this is what we think we can do with the electric future. Um, it's kind of a rolling showcase. So they took it to Bathurst earlier this year and set a new lap record in it. Well, unofficial lap record, but hey. We'll still, we'll still claim it. A minute 56 or 58, whatever it was, is pretty damn fast. Um, but yeah, they had it on show all weekend, pretty much. They had it on the ground over the weekend you know, when it wasn't out doing parade laps and that sort of thing so people could poke around. And in person, it looks like a proper race car. It doesn't look like a sort of science project. All the bodywork matches properly. There's some really clever aero going on. Um, getting in is a struggle. Um, for you or for anyone? <laughs> for anyone. So it's quite a big step up over the, the high floor with the roll cage there. That was the easy bit for me with my long legs. But once you're in there, um, they had the seat as low as it would go and I just could squeeze in under the roll cage. Um, it's pretty amazing though, as soon as you're in there, how quickly you forget about how tight it is because the driver, Dan Ricardo in this case, put his foot down and it just like shoves you back in your seat so hard. It, it doesn't feel like a van or anything like I've ever experienced. And he was really having a go, it felt like. Under braking in particular, you could feel the car sort of moving around a little bit. Um, yeah, incredible show of what electric motorsport could be in the future. And, Contrasting that with the Porsche Mission X concept, which was also on show of the Grand which Prix. Which looked incredible. In way. person, it's really special. Uh, it's, it's got this real presence about it. I think brands are starting to realize that they can do exciting things with electric power. Whether or not it's gonna be as exciting as what we have at the moment is another question, but there are some pretty cool ideas about the future. Now, did you, you got a ride along with uh, Mr. Ricardo. I did. May have been the fastest he went all weekend, poor guy. <laughs> um, but uh, did you bring, do you have a clip from it? I do, yeah. So uh, Ford set up a whole lot of GoPros around the car. Uh, they're all showing me on the inside and I look red faced and fat in a too small helmet next to like super polished, super calm, super well presented Dan. Um, I would also like to say what you don't get on the clip is that he genuinely was a really lovely guy. Um, he and I had a bit of a chat as we were driving back in through the paddock because we had sort of five minutes as he crawled behind the Red Bull media car to get back to the Ford tent. And he was really personable, really friendly and interesting and sounds like a really small thing, but you've met professional athletes and drivers before. They're very good at thinking about themselves and less good at thinking about others. He hopped out of the car to this massive scrum of people, huge like, you know, wave of cameras and reporters. And he hopped out and I said, oh, they're here for you, not me. You go and I'll, I'll wait for them to clear out and then I'll clamber out. He's like, all right, I'll make sure I leave the door open so that there's some air coming through. Just little things like that that show that he actually is aware other people exist beyond him. Um, I obviously was disappointed in how the weekend went for him, but I did come away, I suppose, believing the hype about how nice of a guy he was because he, he really was lovely to spend time with. Mm. All right, well, let's play that clip now. Hey, this is pretty exciting. Yeah, it's, this, thing is, this thing is pretty unhinged. Did you expect to be driving an electric van this weekend? No. <laughs>
awesome, thank you. So it really feels like you're in a tunnel coming around the back there. Yeah, it's it's pretty full on. This thing's pretty fast. <laughs> <laughs> have you been in a race car before? I have, yeah. Yeah. Does this does it feel heavy? Uh I think in my head it feels heavy, but it's not. Yeah, okay. Like I think there's still more there's still more potential. Yeah, gotcha. What have you been in? What race cars? I've been in a supercar and then in a GT3 Porsche. Yeah. Um, not around here, obviously. But this yeah. is also a fast track. Like yeah, it's, gotcha. It's pretty full on. Yeah, I know that the drivers always say they like driving here, but like, it, it's actually a fun one for you. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, one of the big things that Australian, well, that local uh, manufacturing groups like to do is show off new cars around Grand Prix week, obviously a lot of hype around motoring. So if you guys just want to tell us a couple of the cars that you've seen come out over the last week, it'd be good to just uh, run the ladies and gentlemen through that, I think. So for me, the, the exciting couple were the Toyota GR Yaris update. Uh, Josh, who's reasonably new to our team, went along and checked that out. And then Ford had the Mustang Dark Horse on show as well. And Ford is growing its presence in Formula One. From 2026, they're building engines alongside or for Red Bull, depends on who you ask on that one. <laughs> Maybe, it's still um, up in the air, I think. <laughs> but that Mustang Dark Horse we talked about last year on the podcast, it is a really exciting old school muscle car with a sort of new school interior and the crowd of people around it would suggest uh, that plenty of people are interested. The other one was that Porsche Mission X and I've got some footage of the light show that they put on around that. People could walk through this tent. Uh, a really cool way to get people engaged with what is hopefully, despite Porsche not actually saying they're going to build it, their next hypercar, the sort of electric Carrera GT, basically. Uh, I'm curious to know what you think of how it looks. It, it got revealed last year, didn't it? And I, I, I think I had sort of mixed opinions on it when I first saw it. I think from, from the front and like the front quarter angles, it looks really, really nice. It's got like a really cool new age sort of design to it, but it also sort of harks back to the old Le Mans races or the, or the prototype cars. Um, I'm not always a fan of like the really weird sort of back ends of some of these hypercars now. You know, it's, we've seen it with the, um, What's that other one? Was it the Brabham? No, not the Brabham, the other one. The the McLaren guy. He has like the big aeroplane style like- Oh, so the Speedtail. No, there was the other brand, the T60 thing. Well, not oh, the T60. Gordon Murray. The Gordon yeah. Murray, that's the one, With yeah. the turbo fan jet engine. Yeah, 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 so I find that a little bit too much because you know, when you have a really sleek front and like beautiful front and then like this really wild rear end, it sort of is a little bit off-putting for me personally. But I think, you know, Porsche has done a really great job at applying its really classic and beautiful design principles to new cars. Like you look at the Taycan, for example, and it looks fantastic. Um, I've really started to warm to the new electric Macan. And if that's a sign of what's to come, I think that, you know, especially with their sports cars, they all look great. I can only imagine that even this hypercar will transform into something really cool as well. Yeah, it's got a lot of LMP1 vibes mm. going on with that. And I have to say the interior looks, I don't, I don't know whether that'll ever make it to production, well, but it looks unreal. We got to sit in it. Yeah, right. So they were saying that this car has done a world tour um, and it's now going to the Porsche Museum. Oh, cool. So we were the first ones to be allowed to sit inside. And when I say inside, I got to sit on it. Um, they were telling us that the gap between the seats is narrower than the gap between the seats in a Cayman or a Boxster, and that's not a big car. But the seats themselves are built into the carbon tub. And obviously I took my you know, shoes off, very careful with this one of one prototype concept car, but I couldn't get my hips into the seat. I'm too <laughs> wide to fit. So yeah, if you are tall or wide, like a lot of Australians are, you may struggle to get your bum into Porsche's new hypercar when they eventually build it. Yes. Well, um, I think uh, sadly for us, none of us are gonna be able to afford one of them. So it's no. not a problem we're gonna have, <laughs> uh, unless the podcast goes really well. So please subscribe. <laughs> <laughs> yes. All right, well, uh, look, as cool as all of those cars are, we do need to come back to our the real usual, world. Yes, our, uh, the usual thing we talk about. We're gonna talk about Toyota Prado, um, because James, you went to a Toyota CHR launch last week, which we will talk about later, yes. but you did get some interesting little tidbits about what may be coming with Prado in the future. Yeah, so Toyota's made obviously a big point of hybrid in its range. And you know, one of the really big selling points about most of its products right now is that you've got an attainable, affordable, and very efficient hybrid option in most of their passenger vehicles that you know they're seeing 70 to 80% uptake on every model line. Um, one of those new cars now that you know is very popular for them that doesn't currently have a hybrid option available here is the Prado. And you know, we've seen that a lot of brands have sort of either been fairly 
cautious about coming into like the specialty four by four and utility segments with electrified options. And you know, Toyota revealed a, a turbocharged hybrid option for the Prado overseas. So in I think North America and some other markets, the the Land Cruiser, as it's known over there, will get um, a very similar hybrid system to what's on offer in the Lexus RX 500 HF sport performance. Mm -hmm. Catching <laughs> the pace with yes. pack one. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So a slightly weaker version of that. I think it's tuned to deliver about 230 kilowatts in the Prado. Uh, and they're also going to offer that engine or drivetrain in the related Lexus GX, which I don't know whether they'll get more power or not, but there is a version of that coming too. Now, with regards to Australia, you'd think that that would be a surefire hit here because, you know, the Prado is like the top selling large SUV in the country. Everyone buys them. And given it's a very diesel dominated segment, there might be a lot of people that are moving into electrification. Sean Hanley hasn't really given much, just, much of that. Just to be clear, Sean Hanley, uh, Toyota Australia Vice President of Sales, Sales and Marketing. Yes. Yeah, so the yeah. one of the Toyota executive who I spoke to um, was saying that they're still assessing the validity and the business case for it here. Um, they haven't really got a position on it or a confirmation yet, which is kind of surprising given the car's literally just about to launch in North America. Uh, so far, we only have the mild hybrid diesel available here, which is their high-end well, the, diesel powertrain. The very active technology. Whatever yeah, the V active yeah. on the Hilux yeah, is and also a version of the Prado. Yeah. And the other upgrade to that is that it gets now an eight-speed automatic as opposed to a six of the old ones. So it should be more efficient and perhaps more drivable than mm. the old one because you've got extra ratio ratios would be nicer on the freeway. You've got the better stop start sort of um, function where it'll turn the engine off as you coast to a stop and things like that. So where, you know, the, the new Prado is still a couple of months away from hitting here with that drivetrain. So we'll sort of have to reserve our judgment till then. But I'm interested to know what you guys think about, you know, electrification of these kind of cars, because, you know, Prado is sort of like an icon here and adding a proper hybrid system is a big change. Like, do you think that we should have that here or not? Well, just on it to give some context to the people at home, um, new Prado is coming, a lot of time and R&D and money spent obviously redesigning it, making it look good, but it does have the same 2.8 litre uh, fossil diesel. version of it, yeah. yeah. Which is a bit disappointing, I think, is, especially because they're now touting three and a half ton towing capacity, which as we've tested Hilux in the past, we've done towing tests, it sort of, it does it, but like, it's working hard. It's working hard. It's doing it. And so you now got a bigger car, bigger, a bigger, heavier car, a lot more tech inside it, and it's going to have that same engine. So I guess that's when you look at what we've got with Lexus GX with the twin turbo V6, it's a little bit of a disappointment. But The anyway. other one that comes to mind there for me is the Tank 500. And that's probably one to talk about next week on the podcast. The info is under embargo, but it is hybrid only for Australia. It is a big, comfortable seven-seater. And um, it is interesting the impact hybrid power has on a car like that. I think, uh, I think that once people have had a chance to experience smooth, quiet, comfortable in the city in a way that maybe a diesel isn't, there will be a bigger push towards that sort of tech in the segment because without giving the game away, it does really bring some benefits even though it's a different experience to what you get in diesel. I think as well, you look at Isuzu, which uh, is obviously potentially under the pump in Australia with new emission standards because it sells two big diesel cars. It's revealed a mild hybrid version of the D-Max in Thailand and also an electric version. Um, a lot of Toyota's rivals have now realised that they need to bring this tech in. They're moving towards it quite quickly. And well, Ford have got a plug-in hybrid Ranger. Yeah. Very, very close to Australia, I think. So, yeah, the segment is moving in that direction and Toyota's the hybrid leader for now. I think it needs to stay that way. I think the I want to talk about the Isuzu thing really quickly because I find that quite quite fascinating. So they've got uh, the EV concept has dual electric motors, a 40 kilowatt front uh, motor and a 90 kilowatt rear motor. Mm -hmm. They're still claiming, or was it 130 kilowatt combined and 325 newton meters. Now that's down a lot on what their diesel currently is. And I, I don't know whether they've said anything about towing figures, but you would hope that it could do what the current D-Max does at three and a half ton. It's not going to do a very good job with those sort of figures, I would imagine. I do think we need to remember that not everyone uses their ute to tow. And I think that's been a hold up for a lot of people with electric utes and electric commercial vehicles. I absolutely love the idea of a D-Max that just is a straight like-for-like -like petrol versus electric. But when you drive through work sites, for example, in the city, there are always utes sitting there idling with their lights flashing with stuff in the back. When you go to ports and that sort of thing, there are always diesel-powered vehicles running around directing trucks and traffic and containers. They're the sort of applications where an electric motor makes a heap of sense. And just because this electric D-Max might not tow three and a half tons and replace your D-Max X-Terrain, doesn't mean it doesn't have a purpose. It just means that it's maybe designed for a different subset of ute owners until we can finally get electric power or plug-in hybrid power or even hydrogen power to the point where we can replace that diesel engine. 
Now, hydrogen power was a talking point at the Toyota event you went to last week. So tell us a little bit about what they've, they haven't confirmed anything, obviously, yeah, but, yeah. but what they've sort of suggested. Yeah, so I thought it'd be interesting to ask about hydrogen because globally, hydrogen's a really big um, like business pillar for Toyota as a business. And in Japan and other markets in the world, there's much better infrastructure than there is here. Because like, I think we have like one refueler in Altona, which is a Toyota <laughs> refueler. I think there's fewer than 12 in Australia, including all the ones under construction. Yeah, so the, it's it's very limited infrastructure at the moment. But, um, you know, Toyota has the Mirai here as a, I think it's like a fleet lease sort of program where some and counts- And do the same thing with the Nexo. Yeah, exactly. There's a couple of brands that do that kind of thing. Um, and Toyota has the cars on the road. They're just not fully supported yet for mainstream sales. And, and what I was told was that, you know, the, the way that the, the executive sort of lit up and spoke about hydrogen as if it's much closer to um, being a thing than we might think, basically saying that Mirai is sort of like the new Prius for Toyota. And for the first 10 years of the Prius in Australia, they saw like 500 and then suddenly as um, hybrid power started proliferating throughout the lineup, they saw much larger uptake. Uh, they, I was sort of led to believe that that was the sort of vision that they had for hydrogen here. And with improved infrastructure within the next 10 years, we could start seeing a much better support for that fuel type and also a more mainstream range of vehicles from Toyota. Now, these are all, you know, mm. the big claims that we can't really substantiate at the moment, but the intention for them is to take the Mirai, for example, as a mainstream vehicle that's sold in dealerships alongside their hybrid electric sub. Well, they've got one electric car right now, but that kind of thing where it sort of is a part of their multi-solution strategy that Toyota has been touting for the last like 12 to 18 months. So it's a it's an interesting thing, I guess. You know, a lot of a few other brands have talked about hydrogen in more heavy duty applications. I spoke with Ineos about it not long ago, and they um, they were sort of saying a similar thing, where something at heavy duty with towing or yeah. you know heavy commercial hydrogen makes more sense because you know electric vehicles when you put load or stress on it, they, they deplete their batteries quite quickly, whereas hydrogen is more conventional. You fill it up and all that kind of yeah. thing. Well, Hyundai run a. a prime mover, a hydrogen prime mover in Europe that you can actually purchase. So, and there's yeah. now hydrogen trucks being made in Melbourne. We, mm. we were on the news a couple of weeks ago talking about that. So it definitely in that heavy vehicle space makes a lot of sense. And I think Toyota, when they've spoken about it, have spoken about it in the context of like a Land Cruiser, for example. Yeah, exactly. Where you do need or owners want that ability to go deep into the wilderness and not have to stop for a long time to charge. So the tech, it feels like definitely has some potential mm. benefits, but it's going to be interesting to see in the next couple of years if Toyota's solid state batteries they've been talking about do develop at the pace that they have. Well, that becomes a very different conversation if you can offer a thousand Ks of range in a Land Cruiser sized vehicle with a battery that's also you know, very resistant to heat and cold and that sort of thing. At that point, maybe you remove the need entirely for a hydrogen powertrain and you can run a really efficient petrol generator, for example. Um, it's going to be interesting to see if developments in the battery space do render hydrogen irrelevant for most people. Mm, well, I think if anyone's going to do it, it's the Japanese because we know Nissan are working on solid state batteries with that um, the new battery GTR plant, yeah. hyper car concept that they showed off in Tokyo last year. Yeah, Toyota are talking about it. So I think if anyone's going to do it, it's probably going to be a Japanese manufacturer and they're probably going to combine some forces to make it happen, hopefully sooner rather yeah. than later. Because, um, yeah, I don't see that... None of the other mainstream EV manufacturers seem to be working on it too much. They're just sort of focusing on the, I guess you'd almost call it a tried and tested battery technology at this point. So. I think there's also a wariness from a lot of brands to talk about what's coming next because that's one of the big fears people have before buying an electric car. It's one of the reasons that I would struggle to spend a lot of money on a Taycan like we were talking about before. Oh, do you have Taycan money, do you? Yeah. I wish. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, different part of the problem. <laughs> Um, but knowing that battery tech is developing so quickly, uh, I suppose if you're keeping this car for four or five years, you're afraid of what it's going to be worth down the track. You don't know whether the tech is going to be obsolete by that point. And if you are a brand that's selling big electric cars, expensive electric cars, if you spend too much time talking about what's next, people aren't going to want what's coming now. So It's the iPhone thing, isn't it? Yeah, so, absolutely. Yep. Yeah, yeah, okay. Now I'm curious, before we move on from this topic, I'm, I just on... Bring it right back to Prado. Uh, I'm curious, would you guys, would you grab a run out model Prado now, if you can find one? Would you wait for the new one to come and grab one of those? Or would you hold out and wait for some hybrid stuff to show up in a year or two maybe? For me, it's gonna be the, the one that's arriving mid-year. Mm -hmm. um, one of the great things about Toyota Land Cruisers, Prados, that sort of thing is they hold their value incredibly well. And given how little we know about the hybrid at this stage for Australia, could be a long time coming. So I love the look of the new Prado. I think it's gonna be much more modern inside, more spacious and, I know that we've said it's got a carryover version of the engine, but new transmission, new hybrid, mild hybrid tech. Uh, 
I would be uh, pushing my chips into that part of the table to start with. What about you, James? I have a pretty similar position on that. I think that you know, a country to to me being labelled as a tree hugger in some of the comments <laughs> in recent times, um, I still think there's a really um, big space for diesel in these kinds of applications. And I think that's why Toyota mm. <laughs> relies so hardly on it. Um, you know, the, the way that diesels deliver their performance while also maintaining a level of efficiency with the new developments in the, in the powertrain tech from Toyota in the Prado, I think it'll be more efficient, nicer to drive. Um, while also maintaining the characteristics that make the Prado so popular, because a lot of people like to say that uh, diesel's dead, but you know when the top four or five vehicles in the country mm -hmm. are diesels, it it tells you that there's still a place for it. And if things keep developing, we're still quite behind. You know, Europe, for example, on like emissions tech and things like that. You can still make diesels almost petrol clean and still more efficient, and keep them in a, a part of the market that serves that type of vehicle well. So I think you know if you're thinking about buying a Prado but you're not sure whether to wait for like a, a, the hybrid one if it's going to come or the diesel. My experience with the Lexus RX with the same engine was that it's not super efficient anyway. It's sort of more of like a performance-led version of Toyota's hybrid tech. So if you're look, expecting it to be like RAV4 efficient, I don't think that's going to be the case. So, you know, considering what the typical Prado buyer does, the diesel, I think, is still a really great fit. And if you want more power, you get the Lexus. Mm -hmm. Perfect for those uh, running to soccer fields on Saturdays, which is what the usual Prado buyer does. I think <laughs> yeah, them do, definitely, <laughs> yes. Um, where I come from, that's what a lot of them do. Uh, okay, so this week in What Would You Buy? Uh, I'm curious to know what small hybrid SUV would you buy? We ran a story on the website over the weekend. Uh, it's on carexpert.com.au. Check that out. But hear from the horses' mouths. Uh, we'll <laughs> horses, <laughs> horses, horses. <laughs> yeah, a lot of plurals there. Uh, what would you got? James, I'll go to you first. What small hybrid SUV would you buy? Well, there's a lot of options, but for me, I think from a value perspective, I think the new Hyundai Kona hybrid is a really, really good option. They off uh, Hyundai has been really good at offering lots of diversity in their new ranges. They offer multiple versions of hybrids. You can have them with like the standard SUV look or the N-line sportier look. Uh, you can have it as a base or a high spec one. There's lots of colors and all that kind of thing. So it's a, I, I like the drivetrain too, having a, a, a dual clutch transmission. I know some people sometimes get worried about like the lurchiness or reliability, but having driven that drivetrain quite a lot in a, in a various amount of um, Hyundai and Kia products, it's a really nice thing to drive. Um, it's still really efficient. You can get about four liters per 100 Ks without really trying, which is pretty impressive. And, you know, the Hyundai's done a really good job with their ownership program as well. So, you know, it doesn't cost that much to service. It's really cheap on fuel. It looks kind of cool and you can make it yours with all the various options available. So for me, that was a, and it's not too expensive either. You can have one for under 50 grand if you want a high spec one, or I think the base hybrid now is 39,990 drive away, yeah, which right. is really good value for And me. Hyundai do a really good job with the practicality. Like the, the way they utilize space in their car is, is probably some of the best in, out of that category, I think there's a lot of really good storage compartments, a lot of good space in the boot. So good on Hyundai for that one. Uh, Scott, what's your pick? Uh, I'm going to keep this short and sweet because if I take that long, we'll be here till tomorrow. Uh, Nissan Qashqai TI e-Power. Okay. Um, I think it's smooth to drive in a way that most hybrids aren't. I think it looks great and I really like the posh sort of interior. I do wish they did a cheaper version though. Mm. Yes, that is probably a sticking point with that one. But it does look fantastic. To it does. Credit. Uh, now, so... One of the things I, I find really frustrating is trying to research cars. Now, you can go to all these different websites, you can go to different dealer lots, and it's always a bit of a pain, it's a, you know, especially if you have to go to different dealer lots. But yeah. what we've done on Car Expert is made a really simple research tab, which can help you find uh, the car that you're looking for or narrow down the choices. So head to Google, type in Help Me Car Expert, and you'll be able to research a new car, find the one you like. We can connect you with the dealer and probably get you into the new car sooner than you might think, because there is a lot of delays on new cars at the moment still to this point in time so simple google help me car expert and if you do use the service leave a comment and let us know how it was all right it's time for our review of the week it is the toyota chr now james you went on the launch last week it's a i think it looks really cool it's a really but i think i don't know whether everyone's going to feel the same way it's quite a striking design i think that seems to be where toyota is moving at the moment because you see the new camry um the bz4x they're really pushing that that almost lexus -y look to their new cars yeah. now. So how was the CHR in the flesh? Uh, I really like the look of it. I think the, the two-tone paint is quite striking and interesting and you get a lot of looks. Um, we had some that were like bright reds and bright yellows mixed with that black and it definitely turns a lot of heads. I know it's not for everybody, but neither was the first one. So it's a very design-led uh, 
vehicle and compared to say something like a Corolla Cross, which is basically the same car underneath. And I think that what it offers is a really conventional Toyota driving experience and ownership experience, but it makes it look interesting and special in a way that none of their other cars really do. I think it's sort of like a, an attainable way to get that sort of Toyota premium thing that they do in Japan that they don't offer here with like the Crown and, and some of their other, other products, the Prius even. And, you know, it's got it's a lot more expensive now, but it, it looks and feels a lot more premium than the old one. The old one was already quite upmarket. Just when you say a lot more expensive, how much more expensive is it? Because it's like 10 or 15 grand, isn't so it? So the base one's about 11 grand up on the old one. And then it's a similar story for the Cobra, the GR Sports, a new name plate, but that's a $55,000 car. That's a lot of money for a little SUV. And it's pretty much Lexus money. Mm. So well, it starts at 43 for the base model, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, which is, which is a lot. It I've, sits side by side with that new Lexus LBX, mm. which Jack has just driven price-wise. They're almost like for like, aren't they? Almost, yeah. But the LBX is based on the uh, Yaris Cross, not the Corolla Cross. So if you get like pedantic about what it's based on and what you're getting for your money, um, the CHR is also much larger than an LBX. But in terms of how it drives, it really just drives a lot like a nice Corolla or Corolla Cross. It's all the same drivetrain, same architecture. It's really just comfortable, fluid to drive. The steering's really nice and responsive. It's It's got a really nice balance in the ride. So, you know, our launch drive was in Melbourne City throughout to um, the Victorian Hill or out in the Dandenongs. And it was just really well suited to all of that. The only thing that let it down for me was the lack of grunt from and engagement from both drivetrains. Even the more powerful um, GR Sport with its 145 kilowatt two liter hybrid system looks good on paper, but you probably like in terms of zero to 100, it's probably about eight seconds. It's not super quick. But uh, so the lack of engagement, like the GR Sport doesn't have paddle shifters. The Toyota will say it has like a seven speed CVT on it, but it doesn't really feel like a conventional transmission or particularly sporty to drive. So I wouldn't necessarily go into it thinking that you're going to get like a really sporty car to go with the the looks it's still very much a Toyota hybrid that just looks really cool so as a daily driver great I wouldn't be buying it though as like a performance alternative to something like a Volkswagen T-Rock or you know like a base Cooper Formenta for example. What about space in the back and the boot because that last CHR was great if you were in the front seats and not yeah. great if you were behind. Yeah it's a similar story with the new one it's not that different in the rear seat. You still have a, like a high shoulder line as well. So it's pretty dark back there. Uh, you know, for six foot one-ish me sitting behind myself, it's pretty snug. Mm -hmm. And I think that kids would be a little bit claustrophobic in the back and perhaps a little bit nauseous if, they, if they're prone to car sickness. Just how are you driving this car? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Um, but And the boot is a decent enough size. I think it's like a, in the 350 litre realm, which is fine, but nothing it's great. It's not stand out for no, the price. No, exactly. So it, again, it's like what people buy these coupe styled SUVs for though. It's not for massive boot space or a massive back seat. You're buying something because you like the look of it. And you know, in this case, it's a Toyota that looks interesting. Um, and I think it's got a lot of solid um, parts to the offering that make it a, a good choice in that segment. There's not a whole lot that it competes with. And you know, if, you can't really call it dull. Mm. So we sort of glossed over the drivetrains. I just want to talk about that quickly. There's two options. So you get a two-wheel drive or an all-wheel drive. Now the two-wheel drive, I'm going to go off the sheet here. Yeah. <laughs> um, two-wheel drive has a 1.8 litre four-cylinder. They're all hybrids, by the way. Right. Yep. Um, and the, the all-wheel drive has a two-litre four-cylinder. Now I'm curious, on the two-wheel drive, it just has a front electric motor. All-wheel drive has an electric motor on the front and the rear. Is there a compromise on boot space when you go from two-wheel drive to all-wheel drive? So there is a small change because there's um, there's obviously electric motor underneath, but it was it was very minimal. The the main difference is actually between the base model and the two higher ones because they've got the premium sound system. They don't have a spare tire in the higher grades. So if you want a space saver spare wheel, you have to get the GXL. Otherwise, you get a tire repair kit. Right. Okay. So, not exactly designed for. Conquering the Simpson Desert, but um, it's not really the point of any no, of <laughs> nice UVs, is it? No, so uh, I'm very curious about it though, because like we said, we started out, we talked about the looks, looks fantastic, doesn't drive quite so good. And you already sort of inferred that you'd probably go a T Rock or something over it, similar sort of price. It just depends on what you're after. So yeah. if you want something that actually goes the way it looks, I wouldn't say the CHR. The CHR drives like, a, you know, a premium ish, like comfortable. Comfort focused it's SUV. Not a sports SUV. No, exactly right. It's very comfortable, really refined, and super efficient. Like we were getting under five liters per hundred k's without really trying. 
uh, if you want something that's more performance oriented and more in keeping with how the CHR looks, for example, I just don't think it, you'd be you'd be better off buying something that's European with a proper transmission, maybe a turbo, um, because even though the, the GR Sport um, quotes 145 kilowatts, which is a fair bit for a car that size, it's not it doesn't feel like that when you're driving it. So that's that's more what I, I was getting at. Okay, so would you your money on the table? Would you go the all-wheel drive, or would you just stick with the two-wheel? I drive? think the Cobra two-wheel drive is pretty solid value at, at that fifty grand price point. It does it is a little down on power, even compared to something like a Corolla Cross top spec with the two-liter hybrid. But in terms of how it looks, the way that it's it's got a really nice cabin. It's got all the the more premium touches from the Toyota stable in terms of like the big infotainment system, the digital instrument cluster and some of the nicer finishing like bucket seats and things like that. It looks and feels quite nice and quite special. And to get that in say the equivalent Lexus, uh, you have to spend 10 to $15,000 more on a, on a UX which shares the same platform. And you know, in terms of running costs, it's like just over, it's like 200 bucks or $250 a year to service. You've got the really long um, drivetrain warranty if you service it within the Toyota network and also it doesn't use any fuel. So, you know, you can almost get a thousand Ks on a tank if you're if you're smart with where you drive it, and it's pretty fuss-free driving if you and it still looks interesting. So, so it's a Toyota, pretty much. <laughs> yep. It just looks different. Yeah. Okay. Well, good on Toyota for having a crack. All right. So it's time for our picks of the week. Uh, I'll throw I'll throw over to James first because I know he's got a good one. So. <laughs> <laughs> what do you got this week, mate? Uh, so in the in the theme of F1, um, there was a couple of funny videos coming out of the qualifying sessions over the weekend where I think Max Verstappen and Charles Leclerc had issues with during their flying laps had Aston Martins in the middle of the track slowing them down and both of them had quite funny things to say but the way Charles verbalized that basically just saying there's one thing that's guaranteed every time is that you're going to have an Aston Martin in the middle of the track every effing time and just the way he said it made me laugh so it's quite funny. Sad Frenchman. Yes. Yeah exactly. <laughs> what have you got Scott what's your pick this week? Uh, I'm actually turning to our own website. Okay. Um, it's a story that we ran last week from Miles Nurnberger who is the designer of the new Aston Martin van and he was talking about something they call the piss-off factor. Uh -huh. uh, it's how they decide what buttons stay and what buttons go in their new car interiors. I thought it was a really interesting way of describing something that we all feel when we drive new cars. And it's nice to know at least one brand is um, putting it front of mind. Aston Martin's version of the pub test. I exactly, think. yeah. Yes. Uh, well, mine is uh, also F1 uh, inspired. It's got to be uh, Valtteri Bottas's Uber <laughs> yes. car share. Yes. It yes. Is for, if you haven't seen it, they've found a 2012 Holden Omega Ute They've done it all up with all of the things that Valtteri loves uh, about Australia, and he's calling it his second car. Um, I'm curious to know, anyone's watching who's seen it, should we get that car and do a review of it? Oh, I think we should. I think we should. Yeah. I think it'd be great. I think we can get Paul in, uh, we could dress Paul up like uh, Eric Banner, like Pointer back in the day, and <laughs> he can live out his Holden dreams. So. Yes, exactly. Uh, yes, if you think we should get that car and do a review, leave a comment and let us know, because uh, yeah, we'll, we'll certainly try. Uh, that pretty much brings us to the end this week, guys. Uh, any final thoughts before we wrap up? Um, I, think, well, I think we've covered yeah. it off pretty well. So. Yeah, um, I, I do have some homework for you guys though, oh, okay. for the next podcast. Yep. We've had a couple of requests for this, mm -hmm. and I think it's time we actually answer it, is... Um, EV running costs. People keep asking us mm -hmm. about EV running costs. So what I'd like you guys to do is go away over the week and come back for our next podcast with an expensive EV and a, like a more family friendly EV in terms of the running costs. So we can sort of tell people what they should expect. Gotcha. So Sounds good. Some homework for the next uh, for the next podcast. Uh, but thank you all of all of you for joining us this week. Thanks, boys, for coming along. Yeah, we'll be back uh, as usual, sitting at the podcast. Probably Tuesday next week because Monday is Easter. Oh, Monday is Easter. Yes. yes. So yes. Public holiday here in Victoria. Oh, I hope you guys have a good Friday. Oh, I'm certainly uh, going to. <laughs> yes. Uh, lots of chocolate. Hope you get lots of eggs and uh, hopefully you don't have too much of a chocolate hangover by the time you come uh, watch the podcast next week. So thank you all <laughs> of you for joining us. We'll see you next time.